Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Legacy Podcast. My name is Bill Dupenthaler. And I'm Mike Conan, and this is a podcast for disciples who want to make disciples. Hey, guys, this is Bill. Just to let you know, we had a few little technical difficulties with our podcast today, so please uh, bear with the uh, little echoey sound this time, but I hope you really enjoy the content nevertheless. Thank you. Okay, well, hello, everybody. Uh, Bill Dupenthal here with Mike Conan, and we are so glad that you are joining us uh, today for the Legacy Discipleship Podcast. We... uh, had so much fun last week talking about the cross yeah. and the events leading up to the cross. And I mean, I shouldn't say it. We had fun talking about Jesus' death. I mean, no, <laughs> but, but we had a great discussion. Well, it is the centerpiece. One of the centerpieces of our faith is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. So, yeah, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Us, it's, yeah. yeah. It's anyway, it was so good for Jesus. But good for no, us. no, like we said, bad Friday, but, but great Friday. And and um, and we of course uh, today we're uh, we're talking about the resurrection and, and Easter Sunday and, and uh, I love this discussion because it's it, it really does this this whole weekend the cross the death and resurrection of Jesus really is the centerpiece of why we believe and what we believe and why we do what we do and 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 uh, and we've talked about this that that. If these events of this last weekend did not take place, then then really, what's the point? Yeah. And in fact, if only there was something in the Bible that, that said something about it. Yeah, right? <laughs> well, so so uh, uh, many of you that have read the Bible know that that, uh, that Paul was a guy that, that hated Christians. He hated Jesus. He had devoted his life to, to putting this, this thing down because he really believed it was... It was a, a false teaching and, and a cult, and, and, and he was doing everything he could to stop it. And after the death of Jesus, he was, he was trying, to, trying to kill this thing because, because there were all these crazy Christians who were going around preaching that Jesus is alive and, and, and this great, amazing faith that we have. And, and, he, and he was like, I got to shut this down. And he encountered the living Jesus. Yeah. And and what, after that encounter, he completely turned his life around, and he went from being someone who was killing and putting down Christians and arresting them to really the the number one uh, proponent uh, and apologist for the faith, and and he ended up giving his life uh, in, in as a martyr for this this faith. So what happened? How did how did this? transformation take place in his life. Well, he met the living Christ. And, yeah. and, and he wrote about it, and we're not going to spend a whole lot of time uh, you know, kind of breaking this down, but uh, listen to what he says uh, about this whole idea of the cross and the resurrection, and, and in particular this idea that, that if Jesus really rose from the dead, then it's got to be true, but if not, uh, then then maybe this isn't true. Here's what he said in 1 Corinthians 15. He said, but tell me this, since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying that there will be no resurrection of the dead? Uh, For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all of our preaching is useless uh, and, uh, and your faith is useless. And then he said, and we apostles... We would all be lying about God, for we've said that God raised Christ from the dead, but that can't be true if there's no resurrection. And if there's no resurrection, then Christ hasn't been raised. This is all Paul saying this. Uh, And if Christ hasn't been raised, then your faith is useless, and you're still guilty of your sins. And in that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, then we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. That's what Paul said. So if it's not true, then man, what do we have here? What do we have? But if it is true, then it's everything, isn't it? Well, another way to look at that, Bill, is the resurrection is the foundation for the Christian faith. 
Everything is built upon that. So because we believe Christ was resurrected from the dead, we believe that Christ indeed did pay the penalty on the cross. We right. also believe that he was the Son of God. He was the God-man. Therefore, we believe his teachings. And because we believe his teachings, we follow his teachings. Right. And so everything comes down to that belief in the resurrection. Uh, when we were in California, we bought a house that was two-story, which was pretty rare uh, for that area that we were in. And we decided to remodel. And at one point, we realized that uh, the upper story, there was a corner and post that was in place. And so when we did the remodel, we took the floor up. And underneath the floor, when we looked at the post, uh, the only thing that was holding that post up was two two-by-fours. Two two-by-fours were holding up a whole corner of our upstairs uh, in on the ground. So there was no concrete footing. There was no nothing there that was holding our upstairs. And we're in the middle of an earthquake zone. Uh, and that's what it's like, I think, when we don't have a firm foundation. And Jesus talked about building our foundation on the rock, not on the sand. He was very clear that he is the rock. When we trust in him, we trust in the rock. And part of the reason for that is he shows us this in the resurrection, that it's all true. And Therefore, we can trust. Therefore, we can follow. Therefore, we can put it into practice, yeah. all that he had taught us. Yeah. So it really is the foundation for everything that we believe. Well, yeah, because when you talk to people that, that don't believe, or you talk to skeptics, or people that are not, uh, not sure, like everyone would, most every reasonable person would concede that this historical person named Jesus Christ lived. Yeah. And if he lived, they would concede that he did things and he said things. And I think most people would even concede that that we have a biblical that the that the biblical record of the things that he did and the things that he said. Okay, yeah, that's I believe that's true. I mean, it probably is a skeptic, uh, and most skeptics would even concede that because we have historical evidence that he was put to death. You know, it's not just the Bible that says that. So most even even an atheist would concede yes, the guy lived. Yes, he believed that he was. God, because, because that's what he clearly claimed about himself, and yes, he died. Most people would concede that. But it all comes down to, but did he prove it? And and do we how do we know that what he said was true? And that's and, and that's why he died on the cross. I mean that's why he rose from the dead. To prove that what he accomplished on the cross was uh, true. Part of the reason, yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and we've got five reasons we're going to share with you today of, you know, what Jesus showed us in the resurrection, you know, right. I mean, I guess it's not quite that simple, but, you know, you need to have a number, like you said in the podcast today, so. <laughs> the five things that blah, blah, blah. That the resurrection teaches us. Yeah. That's our yeah. thing for today. Or it still says blah, blah, blah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the first thing that stood out that we talked about was, um, and we'll just jump in with what Bill said, which is it proves that Jesus finished what he said on the cross. When Jesus says, it is finished on the cross, it, it was over. Uh, and this is one of the things as a pastor that was, uh, when I was studying theology, and I, I told you this beforehand, it blew my mind. And, and again, that thing when you start thinking about God, you start thinking about the implications of things, and, and then you start thinking more and more, you're like, wait a minute. So you're telling me on the cross it was done. The atonement had been made. Jesus had fully paid the price. You and I, our sins have been forgiven, paid for, wrath of God taken in our place, death taken in our place. When Jesus cried out, it is finished, it was really done. He didn't need to keep going. He, he didn't need to go down to hell to finish the work. He didn't need to do anything else. It was done on the cross. And therefore, when I was first learning about the resurrection, it was kind of, wait a minute, if he didn't need to rise from the dead, why did he? And again, it showed that when he said it is finished, it is finished. And this is Romans 4.25. It says, he was delivered over, over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. And I love that idea that this, uh, the story of the gospel is not just victory over sin and death, but it's also new life in Christ. And, and that's another piece that we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but maybe, you know, the first thing that stands out, of course, is, you know, that was on our list of first, uh, was simply that Jesus shows that he really was the God-man. He shows that he really was the Son of God. Yeah, yeah. 
I mean, that's probably the, the, the biggest thing that stands out when I think of the resurrection, of course, is who else could do that? Yeah. Well, yeah, I love this whole idea, you know, of, of the, the God-man and, and this whole weekend of Easter from the events leading up to the cross where he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, like struggling as a man, like, Lord, is there any way that we can... Uh, not do this. Is there any way that is there any other way that we can accomplish what needs to be done? And and yet I know that that there isn't, and so I'm willing to do it as a man. And and then he suffers as a man, and yeah. then he gets on the cross and bleeds out. Yeah, and he's suffering as a man, but he's also suffering as uh, as the God man. Yeah. And 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 like you said, when when he when he gets to that point and he says it is finished. That was God talking, yeah. You know, and and, and you're right. He, he didn't say it's almost finished. And when I rise from the dead, it's going to be complete. No, he didn't. Say that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And then he to be continued. There was <laughs> yeah. a continued. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sequel to follow. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't need that. It was done. Yeah. I don't. The uh, Romans one says this, and who the, through the spirit of holiness was appointed the son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, and the Apostle Paul makes reference to this many times. This is the most direct one, I think, in Romans 1, 4 there, where he says, we know Jesus was the son of God because he was resurrected from the dead. And it's just that simple. I mean, it really is that simple. There's not one person here, and if you're listening to this podcast and you can do this, would you mind emailing us or calling us and telling us how you can bring yourself back from the dead. Uh, now, my wife works as an ER nurse, and they do bring people back from the dead, um, but they never uh, wait three days uh, and then bring somebody yeah. back from the dead. They've got a couple of minutes. And they never see anybody bring themselves back from the dead. Yeah. Does that make sense? Like, I, they, she's never reported one account of somebody in the, when she's in the ER, you wouldn't believe it, this person came in today, they died, and then all of a sudden they just decided, you know what, I want to come back to life. And they came yeah. back to life. I mean, they could, they know enough about the human body now where they can put a electro electricity in the right place and they can put oxygen in the right place and see revival and, you know, praise God for those advances. But as far as somebody being able to raise themselves up from the dead, we just don't see that. And you know, that's definite proof that he really was beyond human in awesome and incredible ways. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the, the third one, uh, of course, when he died on the cross, he was our savior. And, and we, when we begin to follow him, we, we receive the forgiveness of the cross because, because he's our savior and he died in our place. But the resurrection uh, says that he's not only our savior, but he's also our Lord and our king. And he's the one to whom we bow down and, and he's the king of the universe and he is God and not only just our savior, but our savior and Lord. And he's reigning over the world and will one day judge the world. Yeah. Now, that's, that's the most powerful thought is that Christ, uh, as, I, as we study the resurrection, one of the things that we are reminded of, of course, is just like you said, Bill, that Jesus is king of the world. Uh, and as he's resurrected and especially in his ascension, it says that he's ascended to the right hand of God the Father, and he is reigning over the earth. It couldn't yeah. be more clear that that is Jesus' destiny. Uh, after his work on the cross, when he was ascended, uh, Philippians, I think, is one of those you know awesome ones that most of us have heard before, Philippians chapter 2. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's such a powerful and profound image of who Jesus is. He truly yeah. is the Lord Jesus. Yeah. He is the King. And he reigns over the earth. And his teachings from the beginning, and this is why he was considered such a radical teacher, was his teachings from the beginning were all about the kingdom. They were all about him describing what this kingdom that he's creating would look like and of course, when we think of the kingdom, the most important piece of the kingdom is that first four letters, the king. It's the king, right. And that's where he got in all this trouble is he's describing himself as the king. In fact, remember at the end there, 
Pilate looks at him and says, well, are you a king? And Jesus doesn't deny it. And in fact, he does this very subtle thing. Yeah, that is what you say. Yeah. <laughs> and so yeah. it's like, yeah, well, you said it, not me. <laughs> you know, like, I, I, it is true, but yeah. Well, I, I, about that particular point, one of my favorite uh, parts of the of the um, the the narrative in in the, the gospels of the of that particular part is I think it's in John where where uh, the the Pharisees come to Pilate and and they say hey you made that sign that says here is the King of the Jews and we want you to change it to say he claimed that he was the King of the Jews. And Pilate said, no, 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 I'm leaving it. It's, what he I have is written, the I have king of the Jews. What I've written, I've written. What I've written, I've written. I like that line. Yeah, like yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. yeah. So, and, and, so even Pilate, uh, maybe maybe he didn't really believe that, but he inadvertently was was uh, supporting this idea that, no, he is the king. He is the king. Yeah. That's some real truth to that. Um, and then Acts, the Apostle Paul picks it up again. He says, The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which Jesus will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Uh, again, it's this idea that Jesus is not only king uh, now and reigning over the earth. Everything that happens on the earth runs through his throne room. Nothing is caught, catches him by surprise, and nothing it doesn't happen without his authority. Uh, having said that, though, we're also told he's this judge who's coming. And so the resurrection reminds us, okay, Jesus is the great king. Jesus is the great judge, and he is coming, and he's the one who will judge our right and our wrong. Not us, not our neighbors. Uh, now, in some mysterious way, we learn that we as believers do have some role in the judgments, um, but it's, I don't know how that's going to work either. You know, it's like the 12 apostles, he told them they would have these seats of judgment, and they were all excited about it, but then we also learned Jesus is the great judge. So you're, yeah. I don't know how the mystery works, but I'll say this, uh, uh, Jesus is king, and he's the one who gets to decide uh, what he likes and doesn't like, and in our life, whether he wants to honor it or bless it, and or go the other way. Yeah, so yeah. That's, that's the bottom line. Yeah, and then again, the the next point, point four <laughs> of our five points, uh, that Jesus offers us new life and power over sin. You know, and, and and so this this idea of the resurrection again, it proves that what happened on the cross is true, and it proves that He has the 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 right to be our King and our Lord, and the Bible says that that it proves that we can can receive and take part in the same power that raised Christ from the dead is now in us and we can access that same power. Well, this is the story of Romans 6. You know, Romans 6 is the story of what does the resurrection mean for our daily living now in Christ. Yeah. I mean, and, and this is a, just a couple of you know, shots from there. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. I love that image. Because the Apostle Paul in Romans 5 has just talked about how this whole thing we talked about last week, where it is finished. Our, we've been made righteous because of the righteousness of Christ, not because of how great we are, because all of a sudden now we can do better, uh, that God will accept us. But we're accepted solely because of what Christ has done. And then he gives this pause and says, but it doesn't just end there. Now he's also giving you the power to live a new life, to overcome and resist sin. In the same way, he says in verse 11, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. I mean, that's a great promise for, this, mm -hmm. for those of us who are living today to be thinking about. You know, there's no sin that you're caught in today that the resurrecting power of Christ cannot overcome. A death would be uh, the greatest thing that God could possibly face and he has defeated it. And so whatever it is you're facing, whether it's a pornography addiction, whether it's depression, whether it's uh, a debilitating illness, or whatever it might be, whatever it is that you are facing, a sin habit that you might be stuck in, uh, it doesn't matter in the sense of uh, you've been forgiven by Christ, but at the same time, it matters immensely to God so much so that part of the reason Jesus was resurrected from the dead is that his new life 
could be flowing in and through us to deliver us from those things. Deliver us from evil, as the Lord said, or as the Lord's prayer says. Yeah. Well, then the second part to that is he said that earlier, when I go away, that I'm going to send you my spirit. Yes. Who will then be with you and in you to to help you to live this new life as well. And, and that's another podcast uh, sometime to talk about the role of the Holy Spirit in our life and, and, and uh, this this uh, new era that, that, that was after the resurrection that, that the apostles went into and, and, and uh, were trying to figure out. And that's Actually, I'm, I'm going to stop talking because that, that really is a whole other time. Well, why don't you read the verse? Read the Romans 8 verse there. Yeah, sure. Uh, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit, who dwells in you. Through his spirit who dwells in you. I just love that. Yeah. I, I love the idea that Jesus who is, experiences this most powerful thing in the world, that the resurrection, uh, that same powerful spirit is in us when we're facing our challenges. Right. Amen. And then the last one that we have, and, and this is probably, we could have started with this, but you want to end with a strong one too, right? Yeah. And that's this. We have a living hope, guys. Uh, we too who trust Jesus will be resurrected and we will receive a new body. And Jesus is the firstborn among many brothers and sisters, it says. And so there's this idea uh, that not only is Christ going to be resurrected and glorified, but you and I are also going to be resurrected and glorified. And this is the centerpiece of, in many ways, Christianity, is we are um, living for uh eternity, not for the moment, because of the hope that Christ has given uh, to us. Randy Alcorn has this thing where he says, uh, he draws a dot, and then he has a line going through it to the end of the page. And he says the dot that we experience, that's the tininess of our life on earth, but the line that goes all the way to the end of the page is eternity. And we know eternity is going to be sin-free, it's going to be new resurrected life, it is going to be awesome. And as Christians, that's what we live for. Hopefully, we live for eternity. Uh, those have you seen the NOTWs on cars and stuff? Um, in California, they're everywhere, and it, it stands for "Not of This World." Huh. And I, I love that it. it's like this cool, you know, little sticker. And that's how Christians should live. It's not of this world. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that's and that's really kind of brings it back to how we started the conversation today uh, from First Corinthians fifteen, where Paul's talking about if it isn't true. If he really didn't rise from the dead, uh, then we, of all people, are to be most pitied because we, we're we living a lie and we, and we have no hope. Uh, if, in fact, he goes on to say in that passage, uh, if it's not true and we don't really have this hope and it's all a lie, then let's just, let's just go party. You might as well just go party, eat, drink, be merry, and die because because. When you die, that's it. You just go back into the dirt, and that's the end of your existence. And that's no hope at all. And, and in fact, that's why, uh, I mean, you look around in our world, there is no hope. And, and it's hopeless. If right. you believe that, that at the end of this life, you just are gone, and you cease to exist. And this is why people are, I think, there's, there's so many awful things going on in the world, because people have no hope. Well, they're, they're living for the wrong, wrong, the wrong world. Yeah. They have their citizenship here instead of in heaven. Yeah. Uh, Jesus says these words. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, he shall, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Just love that line. Love that line. Yeah. And that's when he was still alive. And he's giving this promise that he is the resurrection and the life. This hint that he is coming. And it is... Powerful. And he gave many hints, by the way, that he was coming in and showing again that he really was who he said he was. Because he said he was going to do it. The disciples didn't believe him. Like, nobody understood what he meant. But he over and over again told people that he was going to raise from the dead. Yeah. And then he did it, showing again that he was the God-man, that he can forgive sin. Yeah. He has forgive sin. Offers yeah. hope. And that he offers a new life. Yeah. I like how at the end of that verse, too, you, you didn't read it, but it, it, he says, and he, everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And then Jesus says, and do you believe this? Do you believe it? And, and it was, I think it was a rhetorical question. He wasn't really expecting them to answer it. But, uh, but 
what a great question for all of us. Do you really believe it? Do you really believe it? Yeah. Because if you do, it'll change your life. Yeah. A couple more verses on that, and then we can shift into why we believe this stuff. But according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. That's from 1 Peter. And then lastly, by a man has come into come also the resurrection of the dead. Whereas in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Amen. Yeah. Well, yeah. Let's, let's jump into why we believe this stuff. And I'm going to, I stole, uh, we're going to talk about uh, the five E's of Lee Strobel uh, today. And Lee Strobel, if you don't know his story, I'll just briefly say he uh, was a guy whose wife became a Christian. And when he was an investigative journalist, and when he heard that she'd become a Christian and wanted to change all these things in their life, including partying, including all this lifestyle changes, he was not thrilled about it, not happy. So he, as an investigative journalist, set out to prove uh, through investigation that this whole thing was a lie. I mean, it's sort of a modern-day Paul. He was kind of against it. Oh, couldn't be more against it and was appalled and angry that this woman yeah. had changed because he'd signed up for something else. And so he dedicated years of his life to studying all of these things to go back, to be able to go back to her and say, look, it's all a lie. And so they could have their life back right. that he thought he cherished. And then, uh, so he, he looked into all these things and we'll, we'll dig into them a little bit. Um, the first one that he talks about is the early records. And uh, the, the early records, uh, as we think about them, would be um, the oldest text in the Bible uh, show uh, with some really good accuracy uh, that people really believe that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. In fact, as the more that they discovered earlier records, the more it's been shown that these eyewitnesses really captured these things. And it wasn't just one. Numerous, numerous early records show this. And this is biblical, but also extra biblical. Um, Josephus, for instance, captures this idea that the resurrection had caused uh, riots to break out in some cities. And so he looked at the early records and he was hoping to be able to pick a hole in them and figure out a way to show, you know what, and the further you go back, the more you realize this was made up in like the fourth century. Right. So the, the argument would be, no, nah, this was just made up. But Jesus never rose from the dead. And, and you guys just, at some point, they, they added this, these stories in to, to kind of support what they were trying to do. Yep. But in fact, the very earliest records, both biblical and non-biblical, all support the idea that, um, I mean, these people believed it from, from yeah. day one. They they were out running around talking about the resurrection. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the first E. What's the second E, though? Well, just what I was saying, uh, the, the reality is that many, many people saw this. And in that same passage in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, again, I encourage you guys to read that. Uh, it talks about, uh, I mean, Jesus appeared. Uh, well, in fact, first, one of the, this isn't even in our notes, so this is what you call a freebie, Mike? Uh, <laughs> I'm a little scared. <laughs> well, what's he going to say? <laughs> See, Mike's the theologian. I'm, the, I'm the, uh, the, the everyday practical guy, you know, so he's, oh, Lord, help us. We're going to have to edit this podcast. <laughs> no, he, he first appeared to, uh, to some women, which, yeah. which I think one, one of the cool things that, that people yeah. often talk about is, oh, well, you know, yeah, sure, the Bible uh, says all this stuff, but but uh, but how do we know the Bible's true? Well, to me, one of the reasons why the, the, it's so authentic is in those days for them to for them to to say that the first people that Jesus appeared to were women that would have been so countercultural. Yeah, that like sure. you would if you were going to make up a story, you'd never make it up like that. You you probably make it up like well, like Peter, you know, who had denied Christ and, and 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 now Peter realizes yes I'm gonna go back and, and Jesus would appear to Peter first and he would come back you know like arm in arm with Jesus yeah we're in this thing but no he appeared to these women first which which is pretty cool yeah so the second E is the eyewitnesses right right and <laughs> to bring us back to what we were talking about but Bill's, right. Mike. But Bill's right though they, Jesus appears to these women he appears to the apostles uh, and then he, 
to a small group of the apostles. Then it says he appears to over 500 people right, after right, he's resurrected. Right. And so it's not just you know a couple people put together this story. We're talking about first dozens, then hundreds of people have seen this guy after he's been resurrected. So the right. next question then, after you look at the eyewitnesses, and by the way, this was what Lee Strobel spent most of his time on was, can we trust these eyewitness accounts? You yeah. know, and because he's looking at it from the angle of, okay, did these sound like they're mimicking each other? Did they sound like really authentic eyewitness accounts? And when he looked at them, he thought they were pretty authentic. And then, of course, the next question is, well, was he really executed then? Yeah. Well, yeah, and, and just, just real quick, I was going to make another point, too, that uh, as far as we know, uh, there are no records anywhere of any of these eyewitnesses recanting their story. Right. And, and, and later on, somebody coming back and saying, well, actually, you know what, I, I, no, no one ever did that, even when well, their we'll life that. depended on it. Well, we'll get into that in yeah. a minute, too. We'll yeah. get into that in a minute. Yeah. Uh, but execution would be the, so first we have early records, second we have eyewitnesses, and then the third one we have execution. Like, was Jesus really executed? Right. And the, uh, we've talked about this before. If you don't know much about Roman history, they were a ruthless people. Yeah. They executed a lot of people. And they were good. Yeah. Centurions, their job was to execute people. In fact, the rule and the law was is if a centurion was supposed to execute someone and didn't, they themselves would be executed. And these guys were professional executors. There's no way that they botched the job. Uh, there's no way that they, they missed right. this because their very life was dependent on it. And they had no stake in this. Right. Uh, even though one of them at the end looks at him and says, truly, this was the Son of God. I mean, that's a pretty awesome eyewitness right there. Right, right. He's not witnessing the resurrection, but just this moment with Christ. Right, and right. Then, let's just jump into the next one. Maybe. Well, yeah, so so if if we're very confident that he died, uh, three days later there was a huge problem uh, because the tomb was empty. Yeah, the and, and, and empty tomb. Yeah, yeah the empty tomb, the fourth E. And, and we knew... Uh, I mean, it's very clear that they knew where the tomb was. It wasn't like they lost the tomb uh, or uh, it, it, it... They put a guard on it. it. Yeah, they had, they had a, a guard with this Roman seal, and it was, it was yeah. super important to them politically especially and, and, and to avoid uh, any unrest in the community. Uh, I mean, they had to put this thing down once and for all. And, and when they came... They found the tomb empty. Yep. So that's a problem because if if the guy were sure he died and then three days later the tomb's empty, there's a problem. Either either he rose from the dead, or they had some other theories. And and I mean, and from the very beginning, uh, the the and, and the Bible even talks about this. The the soldiers who also again feared for their life, uh, they started spreading rumor. Oh well, you know. Uh, clearly someone came in and, and stole the body. Well, yeah, let's talk about it. Right? Yeah. The first theory was the swoon theory uh, that I think is the one where basically uh, you believe that Jesus d fooled the guards and he was able to stop his, his own heart and, and people talk about, oh, monks up in these places can do this. Um, or even, you know, medical technology wasn't very, you know, good back in those days and, you, you know, I mean, he wasn't purposely trying to stop his heart, but they, they thought he was dead, but he wasn't really quite dead. They had ways to check if people were dead. One of the ways that they did that was they would pierce the side <laughs> right. right. of Christ yes. yeah. in the story. And the reason they did that is because when you die, what happens is your fluids are no longer um, held together, and so they all pool in that spot there. So as soon as they, when it pierced his side and all of his fluids came out, they knew he was dead because right. there was no right. other circulating. So let's not spend a lot of time on that. The hallucination theory is another one that's kind of funny, too, where people think, well, the disciples, they just hallucinated, you know, and it, God bless those guys, you know, and, you know. They believed that they saw him alive because they wanted it so badly. Bless their hearts, you know, right. but they saw hallucinated. Well, here's the thing with that. In, and when you think about hallucinating, there's never been one time in history where people have hallucinated the same thing at the same time. And so that one just falls away right away. And then we get to this little one, like you mentioned, Bill, someone stole the body. And there's three different people that people talk about having stolen potential the culprits. Yeah, right. And yeah. and the Pharisees are one of the ones that are listed. And these are the guys who killed Jesus. So if they had the body, 
I mean, come on. You really think that they're not going to, when all this is happening, that they're not going to bring it forth? Like, that's just ludicrous. Uh, the Romans, someone said that guards stole the body. Hey, they got paid or they did something to steal the body. And so the Romans uh, did it. And again, I... They'd be executed. And, and not only that, with all these riots going on, why wouldn't they show the body? Yeah. You know? And then the, the one that is said, said in the scriptures um, is the biggest rumor was that the disciples themselves uh, stole the body. And so... Uh, that one is the one that carries the most merit, perhaps. Yeah. And this digs into what you had talked about earlier, too, showing that every single one of those disciples died a martyr's death. Every single one of them. Yeah. Except for John, and we don't know about him. He was boiled in oil, you know, for his faith. So don't you think one of them would have recanted if they had stolen the body and said, no, it's all of folks, guys? Yeah, well, and the other thing is, at this point in history, they were running for their lives. Remember, yeah. it was only three days ago that they were denying that they even knew Jesus. They were running away from, from little girls who were saying, hey, he's one of them. I mean, there's there's no way that, that after three days, they suddenly uh, became these, these bold guys that went and overpowered the guards and, uh, and, and rolled away the tomb and stole the body. And then, and then, began preaching this this lie, knowing full well that they had the body stored away someplace. And then, like you said, then they go on to all uh, lose their lives on, on behalf of this, this torture. Uh, yeah, uh, of this thing. So uh, can you absolutely prove that the resurrection took place scientifically? No, you can't prove it scientifically. But can you prove it from a historical proof sense? Absolutely. Well, the, the last one, too, and this is, and we'll, we'll close it down with this, but is the early church. Like you said, the disciples were changed. These went from people who were in fear to people who were bold. Right. And right. we see a radical shift happen after the death of Christ that can only be explained by something happening, and that's the resurrection. The early church, there's no other explanation. No other explanation from the change that we see happen when the disciples lose their Messiah, I think he's gone, to all of a sudden being so bold that they would go to the ends of the earth, that they suffering trial after trial. But when they weren't willing to do that before, something happened. And, yeah. and I think that that's the last piece. Yeah. And then, to, to write it down, the, the way that Lee Strobel ends his book, The Case for Easter, also The Case for Christ, is he writes this. At the end, when I had written all the evidence for the resurrection, I realized it would require more faith for me to maintain my atheism. And that's how Lee Strobel became a Christian, and he's now an apologetist, uh, apologist and works in the church. Uh, and it's just an awesome story about how true the resurrection is. If you could set this prove it, be aware, you probably would become a Christian. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and to me, that's the thing that's so cool about this whole story is uh, to follow Jesus, to be a Christian, you don't have to check your brain in at the door. We, right. we can be so confident that what we believe is true. It's real. It really happened. It's, as, as Paul said, in fact, Christ indeed was raised from the dead. Yep. Well, thank you guys for uh, being with us during this time as we meditate on the foundation for the Christian faith. Yeah. And we hope that this too will become a foundation for you as a disciple, as somebody who follows Jesus, as somebody who follows in those disciples' footsteps of boldly going and sharing and being personally and purposely invested in other people's lives to lead them closer to the Lord. You don't do that unless you believe in this resurrection stuff. You don't do that unless you believe this stuff is really true because it is not easy. It's not fun always. It is fun in many ways, but at the beginning, it's not fun. It's hard. Um, and so we thank you for listening to the podcast. You can always check out more at OurTrueLegacy.com. Uh, we also appreciate it if you like, subscribe, and maybe you've got somebody in your life who you think, you know what, I would love for them to know what this whole Easter thing is about. Send them this podcast, and, and we would love to hear your feedback and how the resurrected Christ has impacted your life, and you could do that, uh, like I said, on archerylegacy.com. We'd also love it if you would consider financially partnering with us, and, and next month we're going to be having our, our financial campaign month, and... If you'd be thinking and praying about that in advance, about how you might financially partner with us, we'd really appreciate it. And we'd especially appreciate it if you'd take some time to pray for us in our ministry. We love you guys, and we thank you for listening. And we just pray that every single one of us would become disciples who make disciples. Amen. Amen.